I don't believe in preaching that frightens. Fear is not a good motivator. I believe in hope. Today I will, by God's grace, bring to you something that gives us reason to fear, but more reason to hope. In fact, I'm going to read again our text, but read it from a parallel called the clear word. And here is what the Bible says in the clear word parallel. Since God wanted to show his intention to keep his promise in a way that we could understand, he confirmed his promise to Abraham by an oath. So God's promise rests on two unchangeable facts which make his word totally reliable. One fact is that God never lies. And the other is that he confirmed what he said by an oath. So having fled to him for refuge, we can lay hold of the hope before us with absolute assurance. This is what gives us courage to carry on. This hope is a sure and steady anchor for our souls. Our hope is not in ourselves, it is in Christ. This is the hope that allows us into the sanctuary behind the curtain where Christ now serves as our high priest after the eternal order of Mel Melchizedek, not after the transitory priestly order of Aaron. I've entitled our study for today, We Have an Anchor. We have an anchor. Would you pray with me? Father, we meet again at this strange place. A place where having done all that I can, I am still not able to do what you've asked me to do. Without the Holy Spirit, I'll be lost. Without your power, this will all fall flat. But this is camp meeting, Father. This is the Holy Sabbath, a day given as a sign between us. And so I trust you today to do what I cannot do. And so today, Lord, I'm willing to be like a fish. If you let a coin be found somewhere in my mouth, I'm willing to be like a donkey. If you put the words of righteousness inside me, I'm willing to be like a little boy's lunch. If you will break me and multiply me until everybody gets what you want them to have. But most of all, Father, Hide me behind the cross. Don't let one soul leave here saying what Walter Pearson did. Let them leave declaring what God did. And if that be so, we shall be blessed indeed. For this is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen. I was listening to the radio the other day and heard a song that was ethnically authentic. But at the same time, amazingly, it expressed the doctrinal posture of the Seventh-day Adventist Church towards eschatology. Now, having spit out all of those $10 words, let's make it play. The song says, there's a storm out over the ocean. And it's moving this away. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. I declare to you today that we are in a strange period of time. And allow me, if you will, to talk a little home talk for a minute. I preach in many places that are ethnically diverse, and sometimes I can't talk like this. But there ought to be a time when we can talk. I believe that God intended for us to be in the remnant church. God knew that as the end of the 2300 day period began to come to, to fruition, as, as he knew that there would be a time of Millerite preaching, of Advent awareness, and then the formation of the Adventist church, God arranged that you and I would be there. 
God apparently went down with his holy angels and pointed slaves to the drinking gourd, the north star that hung in the sky. In fact, NASA, no less, has now begun to say that the slaves must have been more intelligent than we thought. For NASA finally tracks the North Star with precision and understands that without all of those machines and without all of that equipment and technology, God planted in the minds of slaves to know that if you follow the North Star, you'll get out of here. By the time Millerite preaching began, God had planted black people, people from the continent of Africa, those who had been brought to this land against their will had put them in freedom, taught them how to read, given them the Bible, had them search the word so that among the Millerite preachers, there were black preachers. Let me say that we have not come through the side door into the Adventist church. We all might as well get used to each other. We didn't have all the colors here then. We had a little bit of brown and a little red and a little yellow, but you know it was basically black and white back in there. And there are some who love being so unique that they would close everybody else out. But God did not intend for this to be a monolith. God intended that everybody be in this movement. Can somebody say amen? amen? Elder Cheatham, you are a wise man to bring in this emphasis on the Hispanic community. Because these folks are getting ready to show us up if we don't move. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm home. Some of us think that we are, have a corner on evangelism just because we are who we are. You better get up. You better move. After a while, you're going to have to speak Spanish. Are you listening to me? The time has come to move. And I suggest to you, I, I was up late one night looking at a replay of the Hip Hop Summit. Don't get nervous. It, it ain't going to hurt. I listened to some very incisive thoughts. Here is the fact, most of our culture is now being influenced by rap music. And I know you're trying to be quiet now and look down and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Young people are not the only ones listening. Young people are not the only ones looking at BET, my brother. Some of you folk whose ears are too slow to catch every word will look at the video. I'm going to leave you alone. I don't want to hurt you early. But we have come to a time now when the dialogue between peoples who are alike is controlled not by us, but by the moguls who have the money to choose what we see and what we hear. Everybody's angry now because a handful of black young people are getting rich. And so we blame all violence on them. What about Schwarzenegger and... Huh? What about Stallone? What about motion pictures that have gratuitous sex and violence everywhere. Why all of a sudden are people upset blaming it on them? But the fact is that when you search and sift, you come to a realization that there are young people who are actually writing better music than we hear, but people who are greedy choose the worst, put it on the air, put it on the radio, put it on the television, so that young people from every culture are drinking from a polluted stream. Let me tell you something. There's some good music out there in that genre. The fact is that people who want to make money, make a lot of money and make it fast, are choosing the worst of it. And they tell these young people, give me the worst that you've got. 
They didn't get upset as long as it was on Martin Luther King Boulevard. But now it's down at the Galleria Mall. Nudge somebody and tell them what I'm trying to say. So now all the kids wear their pants low and baggy. Saw an old man the other day. Pitiful, pitiful. But this culture has become so invasive and pervasive that nobody listens to preachers. Nobody listens to politicians. In fact, you ought to say something encouraging to every young person who is at camp meeting. Because by and large, young people are not listening to anything religious, to anything uplifting. They have been sold this prurient music by those who do not care about anything but the bottom line. And we are now come to a time where our job is almost impossible. If it were not for the fact that I believe in the Holy Ghost, I'd quit my job. The reason why I don't quit is because I see God make inroads where he can't go every day. We just left Memphis, Tennessee. You know that a certain denomination owns Memphis. Before we got there, they got on the television and on the radio and began to talk the Sabbath down. They talked it down so powerfully that they were supposed to frighten everybody away from the meeting that we held. I want to tell you that my God lives. Even in this hip-hop culture, God has arranged that people listen to the word of God. Over a hundred people came out for three weeks and not every night for three weeks and were baptized because of the power of God. However, you and I should know that we are in danger of becoming irrelevant. When the young people look for help, they don't come to the church because we've gotten to the place now where we got all the blessing we need. Come on now. Let's at least start at a ground level of truth. We had better wake up and know that somebody has got to reach out to help young people. And, and let me say this to you. My wife and I are technically out of the parenting business. You understand if you are a parent. If you've got your children on your knee today and you've got a bunch of paraphernalia around you, don't complain. It gets harder. My wife and I are at the place now where we can't tell the young people what to do anymore. We just make suggestions. I was riding with my son the other day in his car and he inherited a proclivity for speed from somebody. I couldn't tell him how to drive. It was his car. So I just sat over there and Push my right foot almost through the floorboard. <laughs> Grab that handle up there and eventually I just closed my eyes and said, Jesus. He said, Daddy, what's wrong? You praying? I said, yes, I am. Can't tell you what to do, but I can sure talk to Jesus. But if you are like us and you are out of the parenting business, Find another child. Mentor another child. Because we, listen parents, you and I spent so much time and energy giving our children what we didn't have that we forgot to give them what we had. In my house we didn't have much, but we had Jesus. We ate beans and rice with regularity. I stand here as proof that it won't kill you. But we were rich because we had the word of God. Our heroes were never on a football field. Our heroes were never playing baseball. Our heroes were in the word of God. You ought to find another child. If you have already reared your children, find another child and tell them about Jesus. I suggest to you that churches ought to start adopting 
just one family at a time. Because all them cans and stuff, I don't want to talk about you. But used clothes are not making an impact on this society. A judge in Atlanta, Georgia, while I was pastoring there, said, quit giving away little doodads, popping a can in somebody's hand and walking away. Get a family, adopt them, just one church and one family. Give them everything they need, especially Jesus. And when they get on their feet, adopt another one. And we'll finally let the world understand that churches care about somebody. Right now, when your children need protection, they don't call the church. They call the local gang. And you say, it's a terrible thing that these young people getting in gangs. Well, they got to walk down the street, and you sure aren't there. You're inside, cooling. Haven't looked at you. Well, it's early. I don't want to hurt you. And, and we would be okay going in that direction, except there's a storm out over the ocean. And it's moving this way. The fact is that you and I have been talking about it for all these years, and we have not made an impact. But here comes one preacher singing one song, and they get requests all the time. Play that song, storm out over the ocean. I said, that man's singing Adventist theology, singing it better than we preach it. We had better wake up before somebody steals our job. We know that there's a storm coming. In fact, you and I know what the storm is. The Bible says in Daniel, the last chapter, that in a few minutes, Michael will stand up. Jesus is tired of all this foolishness going on down here. He tries to wait until we get in gear and do the job that has been left to us. But we have been putting it aside and passing it on to others so Michael will stand up. There'll be a time of trouble such as there's never been since there was a nation. But I'm not afraid of that time of trouble. As long as Michael is standing up, I'm okay. He stands up on behalf of his children. He stands up in order to give us back what he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A storm is about to come. If you believe it, can I hear you say amen? Some of us act like it's going to be this way forever. We have calmed ourselves down and ensconced ourselves in luxury. God did not give you what you have to sit down and be calm. You don't have your job on the 15th floor so you can act like you are the king of the world. God put you there to talk about his power. God put you there to tell who he is. God has placed you in a strategic position so that you can be a witness for him. But you just let us keep on. There's a storm about to come. If you believe it, can I hear you say amen? The facts, listen, this is from the View and Herald, July 24, 1888. The facts concerning the real condition of the professed people of God speak more loudly than their profession and make it evident that some power has cut the cable that anchored them to the eternal rock and that they are drifting away to sea without chart or compass. So there are some of us who drop by camp meeting. I ain't trying to hurt you, I'm just trying to speak the truth. We've forgotten the rhythm of our liturgy. Got to kind of listen through. Forgot how they talk. You, you picked up Happy Sabbath out there in the, in the parking lot. Kind of forgot we said that, didn't you? Happy Sabbath. Praise the Lord. But you don't know what to do. You don't know when to say amen anymore. You've lost the rhythm. You, you're so caught up in another rhythm that you don't know this one anymore. In fact, you've been trying to sneak and look at your watch so you could tell when you need to get up, but this is another rhythm at camp meeting. You sit down in your own house and watch a movie for three hours and don't get up. You sure ought to be able to worship the Lord for a little while. I ain't trying to hold you, but it is a day that's dedicated to the Lord. Can I hear somebody say amen? So, so then, so then, here is what you must know. There is a storm that's coming. And, and that storm requires that you be anchored to the rock. We know who the rock is. In fact, let me, let me look this up. 
and make sure I got it. I picked this up out of the, out of the uh, clear word to let you know there are many scholars who have been tricked into believing that Peter is the rock upon which the church is built, Matthew 16 and verse 18. But even Peter was not confused about that. For when he preached his sermon in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, he said, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter, a slice from a rock, a chip from a rock. Jesus is the foundation stone. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, the rock that followed Israel was Christ. So today the Lord says to you, there's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. If things stay quiet, you may be okay. But a storm is coming. And when that storm comes, you had better be anchored to the rock. And here is the anchor. Let me be clear. Faith in the atonement is your anchor. Uh, I know I was at the White Estate long enough to know that there are some of us who have gotten old and we want to preach the straight testimony. Lay it on them, Elder. Beat them up. You better watch out. Some of that stuff will hit you. I have people tell me when I finish a sermon, Pastor, you were all over my toes today. I said, yeah, but before I got it to you, it preached to me. It stepped everywhere I had a place to step before I brought it to you. And if it doesn't step on my toes, I won't bring it to you. you you've got to understand that this is the straight testimony. This is Lift Him Up, page 331. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. The fact is that what anchors us to Jesus is the fact that Jesus died to give us salvation. Let me, let me talk about it for a minute. I'm going to try to stay calm too. When Jesus went to the cross, when Jesus was nailed to that cross, there was pain and agony. There was blood that was shed. But when Jesus hung there and declared, it is finished in heaven, those words were translated, it is accomplished. It is accomplished over at the temple. The priest was doing business as usual, picked up his knife to cut the throat of another lamb without blemish, but type had met antitype. The metaphor had lost its meaning, so the priest heard a strange sound behind his back. It was the veil that separated the holy from the most holy place. It tore from the top down to the bottom so to show that no man had done it. And when the priest looked around and for the first time looked into the holy, most holy place, shocked he was. But he didn't stop. Picked his knife up again and was about to take the life of another little lamb when his hand began to tremble. And the knife dropped from his hand. And the lamb scampered away. For Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, had gone to the cross. And no longer did you need a priest to get you to the mercy seat. No longer did you need a priest to get you to the Shekinah glory, which represents the presence of God. The Holy of Holies was opened up to you. Down at the bank, they may not know who you are, but Jesus opened up the most holy place to you. Not the ones with a theological education. Not the ones with an office in the church. Not the ones necessarily who are recognized by the whole organization. The smallest, most insignificant saint can get to the holy of holies by the gift of Jesus. Ellen White says that when Jesus went to the cross, he planted the cross halfway between earth and heaven. And when he did, he made it so attractive that mercy got up and started moving across the gulf. Justice with armies began to move towards the cross. When mercy reached there, mercy knelt down. Justice was a little slower, coming with armies. Finally, justice, looking at the sacrifice of one equal to God, bowed down and said, it is enough. 
and mercy and justice embraced each other and kissed, the hope that you have today is that Jesus has paid the price for your salvation. I know some Adventists think that you are not making any noise in church. But if you come to that realization and don't at least move in your chair, you must be dead. I'm telling you today that I can go to heaven. You don't know my history, but Jesus does. You don't know my faults, but Jesus does. You don't know the things I wrestle with, but Jesus does. And he said, Walter, my sacrifice has made a way for you to get to the Holy of Holies. My sacrifice will get you to the mercy seat. My sacrifice will take you to the room where the Ten Commandments are held. My sacrifice, my blood will save you. Are you listening to me? So today, let me make it clear for all Adventists who are confused. It is the gift of Jesus. Are you listening to me? That is the anchor of every soul. So if you lost somewhere in doctrine land, let me read you something. Don't shock you. Volume 7 of the Bible Commentary, page 458. Hanging upon the cross, Jesus was the gospel. This is our message, our argument, our doctrine, our warning to the impenitent, our encouragement for the sorrowing, the hope for every believer. So when you start talking about the straight testimony, the straight testimony is that Jesus died for your sins. That's our gospel. That's our doctrine. That's the straight testimony. Now I know how you get mixed up because Ellen White wrote so much. I'm getting ready to take you down the path. We're going to do it fast, but we got to go. Come on now. Somebody got one book. One red book, one bookmark, one page, and you've been beating everybody up with that one paragraph for all your life. Well, let me broaden your horizon. There are some things that Ellen White refers to as our anchor, but every one of them is tangential to the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. She says, loyalty to God and faith in the unseen is an anchor. She says that Joseph was held by this anchor. Daniel, she mentions in the same paragraph. So loyalty and faith anchors. She says the only safety now is to search for the truth of the word of God in the Old and New Testament. In fact, I hate to say it like this, because the Bible says, in fact, the spirit of prophecy says, it is written ought to be our anchor. Now, you know why I hate the confusion. Got enough of you folk giving to it is written and won't give anything to breath of life now, but that's what the spirit of prophecy says. The Bible is our anchor. If you believe it, can I hear you say amen? So, so study the word. Don't speed read the word. Spend all day looking at HBO and rented movies. By the way, they got a transcript down there where you rent them. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mess up your Sabbath. They got a computer printout down there. You ought to go down there and look at it before somebody else does. Some of them movies you don't want the saints to know you saw. Oh, y'all mighty quiet. I'm getting nervous. <laughs> but the Bible is an anchor. Can I hear you say amen? The Sabbath, listen, the Sabbath, man not immortal, and the testimony of Jesus, 
These are anchors. However, I get a little nervous when I come to your church and you get up and say that uh, the affirmation of our faith is the fourth commandment. I believe in Sabbath. I believe I probably kept Sabbath longer than most folk under this canopy. My dad was a, a, a meticulous Sabbath keeper. In fact, at one time, I used to live in a house with my grandparents. My grandfather kept Sunday as meticulously as we kept Sabbath. So my brother and I used to keep two days a week. We knew one was wrong, but we had to keep it. We tried to bargain with granddaddy. We said, granddaddy, this ain't the right Sabbath. He said, yes, it is in this house. We kept Sabbath yesterday. You wrong, Randy. My, my little brother would tell my granddaddy, Jesus is going to burn you up. Sound like some of you Adventists around here? <laughs> granddaddy said, yeah, he's going to burn me keeping Sunday. And so we keep Sabbath on Saturday, then we keep Sunday. I believe in the Sabbath. But don't mislead people to think that the reason why I'm a Christian is only because of the Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath because the Sabbath is a sign between me and the Creator. I keep the Sabbath because it is a cathedral in time that God cut out to bring his people together. The Sabbath is not like any other day, but it's not the reason why I'm a Christian. My anchor is Jesus. Amazingly, these three things, Sabbath, the dead are not immortal, and the testimony of Jesus, happen to be the three things that most television channels will not allow you to preach. Let you preach anything else, but you put some Sabbath on there. Gotta go. In fact, now what they do, they look at every program we send them and cut out some, and the ones they cut out have to do with the Sabbath, the state of the dead, and the spirit of prophecy. They let them have, in fact, you know that everybody joined us on tithe a few miles back. Y'all ought to say amen. They said y'all were crazy for a long time. But one of the brethren started that tithe thing and said, my, 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 my. Now everybody returning tithe. Some of them returning better than you are, but I'm not going to hurt you early. <laughs> so, so these are anchors. But, but listen, Revelation 14 is an anchor. The messages of the three angels, anchors, the doctrines plainly understood. Are you listening to? In fact, we've come to a time now when Adventists don't know why we are Adventists. And somebody asked me, and I'm not talking about somebody off the street. Somebody with a terminal degree asked me, you know, Elder, I don't know what's the difference in us and everybody else. Almost choked on my broccoli. Everybody else doing just about everything we're doing except the Sabbath. I said, man, do you know that at a, a, a very, a very, very strange and awesome time in the history of religious development, there came a moment when a, a church was expected to be the difference in this society of ours. Do you know that that until then it was not appropriate for the remnant to appear but then in Revelation the remnant church is called upon and if you look at that time period and see who came a morning at that time you will discover that many others came in the Advent movement but those went away and disappeared and as you look at those who held on we are prominent among them the remnant people, not just folk who do things like everybody else. You are different from everybody else. Call for a time named in Revelation as the remnant people who follow him wherever he goes according to the writings of the 144,000. So you can't be like everybody else. Ah, and you ought to know you're different. I remember the time when if an Adventist left, they could leave, but they could never go anywhere else. Don't play with me, my gun is loaded today. Now we just drift away and go somebody else. 
going on and meet them and say, where are you now? Well, I moved on down the street. Man, you, you can't move down the street from this. When I was over in Africa during the time that a certain leader had stolen the money, the paper that makes money, and then they went to one of these super copiers, digital copiers, and discovered that if you got the right paper and the right copier, you can make money. Now don't think about it. That big face money is a little different. We'll be visiting you on prison ministry day if you try that now. But, but the, the digital copier was so good that they could take that money to the U.S. Mint and ask them to dis determine which was real and which was fake, and they couldn't tell. And for a while, it got hard to use $100 bills outside of the United States. And some people made the error of studying counterfeits to find counterfeits. You cannot find counterfeits by studying counterfeits. You can visit every church in your town. You still won't know any more about counterfeits. The only way to know what a counterfeit looks like is to look at the real thing. And this is the real thing. Not because of our name, not because of our faithfulness, not because we are more erudite, not because we are better than anybody else, simply because we believe in thus saith the Lord. And I wish we would stop confusing people by telling them strange things. I am a Seventh-day Adventist because Jesus paid the price for me on Calvary. And I do only what Jesus says to do. Let me tell you, because we have an anchor, let me do this fast. Because we have an anchor, it shows us some things. Now this you won't believe is in the spirit of prophecy, so let me give you my quote. You know, the biggest book in the whole church is Ellen White Says. So I've tried not to quote from that book. It's a very large volume. This is from Councils on Health 631 and 632. The messenger to the remnant church says that we have in the church now two extremes. We got some folk who are so austere that when young people talk about recreation, their faces go into a frown. When we hear little children's laughter, Stop them, stop them. Now, nobody else said this, but I call them sad Venice. You know who you are. I don't care what happens today, you're not going to break a smile. Somebody get up and sing, you can't do nothing. Sad Venice. Look at all the children running around. Well, when you were a kid, you were doing more than running around. So on one side of the slippery slope, the sad Venice. On the other side, says the prophet, there are some folk who could, cannot exist without entertainment. So they didn't look at it. What's happening tonight? And they can't make it without it. So you got on this side of the slope, the sad matters, and on the other side of the slope, people who can't exist without entertainment. I call them the mad Adventists. <laughs> the messenger says that neither one of these has an anchor. If you got an anchor, the anchor levels you out and gives you a sublime balance. And we need more, can I hear you say amen? If Jesus is in your heart, you ought to smile sometimes without straining a muscle. But you ought not be given completely over to entertain. If you have the anchor, listen, there are people who have the anchor who never have the opportunity to get an education. And I want to pause to say 
that I do not believe that there's a natural tension between the Holy Spirit and education. There are too many preachers who get up and preach, make you think that you ought to stay as ignorant as possible so you can go to heaven. Let's clear that up. I believe Jesus can give you all the education you need, but it'd be good if you bring some when you arrive. But if you never have the opportunity to get a formal education, if you just keep your anchor in the rock Christ Jesus, our messenger says that God will enable you to stand up and hold on because of the rock and your anchor. Then because you have this anchor, you should not go from a state of ecstasy to the valley of despondency when trials and temptations come. In fact, you ought to find yourself anchored in the rock. It'll keep you from being up and down. And you've got friends like that. Come home from camp meeting. Ah! What's wrong with you? Ah! That's before they opened those bills that collected while they were gone. And you call them up at the well. I don't know what to do. Lord won't pay my bills. Folks, if you anchored in the rock, you'd be up at camp meeting, up after camp meeting, up when you got the money, up when you run out of the money. <laughs> if you return to God a faithful tithe and give him an offering, he'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and you won't have room to receive it. Sometimes he'll pay your bills without money, but you got to be anchored in the rock. Then let me say to you, because you have such a firm foundation in the rock, and because you know your anchor is secure, you ought to reach out to get others. I am disturbed that we have lost our savor. What good is salt if it has no savor? What good is a light if you hide it under a basket? There are some of us who are covert Adventists. We've been in the community for 30 years and nobody knows that we go to church. I ain't mad at you. I'm just trying to tell the truth. Amen? When do y'all go to church? Um, well, um, we have friends who go to a church on Saturday and sometimes we join them. You mean you go to church on set? Well, see, uh, what I'm saying is they, they do that. And sometimes in order to blend in and to keep the peace, we will go with them. Not every week, because actually we're just like you. <laughs> see, if, 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 you, if you're anchored to the rock, you don't mind being different. Can I hear somebody say amen? Well, I got the storm identified. I got the rock identified. And the rock is Jesus. Let me tell you what I did to make this thing real. Some of you know how I like to preach. I wanted to get real. I wanted to jump off the page and come up in the house. So after I had identified the storm that's coming and the rock that's there, and then the Bible says you got an anchor, that's your hope. The hope in Jesus sacrifice for your sins I began to wonder why is it then that so many of us are drifting hmm I don't know I don't know Ellie. Just, you know I, I'm trying to hold on well, how, how can't me mingle I don't know I don't know I'm just up here. Well, how are things back at home? Now, don't be careful who you ask that. Ask some folks to mess up your Christian experience on that question. Well, my cousin, you know, he's sick. He's been sick for four years. And my kids, they in jail, all of them. 
My house burnt down last year, and I've been sick, but the doctor don't know what it is. I don't have no money. In fact, I was going to call you this week to see if I can make a loan. Something wrong with that testimony. Everybody got trials, but you ought to have a little blessing in there somewhere. Amen? Get something to hold on to. So I began to wonder, how is it I come among the saints of God trying to find some unity? Because there is a sound that unity makes. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I've been to other cultures where they say, well, we don't make noise. <laughs> Go to a soccer game. All the people rooting for this team, ah, together, together. Because when you are on the same side, unity makes a noise. Unity has a feel. Unity moves from heart to heart. Unity grabs you. I used to feel it, but now sometimes I can't hardly feel it anymore. Got too many surface experiences. Too many microwave Christians. There's a difference between a meal cooked in a microwave. I'll say it again, even though it gets me in trouble. When I travel around, I get to some houses where I hear two sounds. Sound of an electric can opener and the sound of a microwave. I know then that there is danger ahead. If I get hungry enough, I'll eat some of that, but that ain't what I'm looking for. What I want is what got cooked Tuesday, refrigerated Tuesday night, warmed up Thursday for you to take a little taste of it. And so when I walk in your living room, it's all in the drapes and the couch and the, you know the one I'm talking about. That slow cook experience. Unity, the thing we ought to have. And here's what I discovered. I said, let me find out what these anchors supposed to do. I went down to a a yacht store. <laughs> you ought to start at the top. I dressed up best I could. <laughs> Went in and told them the truth. I said, folk, I'm not here to buy a yacht. They were pretty now. But I remembered who paid me. <laughs> I said, maybe not this week. I said, is there anybody here who knows how to sail? Is there a sailor here? Is there a captain here? Is there somebody who's not just a salesman, but somebody who understands how to govern a craft on water? Is there anybody who's been through a... They said, who are you? I said, I'm a preacher. I thought they were going to throw me out. Guess what? They were Christians. They said, you know, that ain't a bad idea. Let me call you somebody. They called an old fella who looked like the sea. I said, how you doing, sir? I, I can help you. <laughs> In fact, among the three or four professionals that I talked to, they got so excited that one of them said, if you're going to preach this sermon, can I go? I told him where I was going. He said, well, no, I can't get there, but why don't you do this when you go? Take this with you. Is there a fisherman in the house? Do you know what this is? He said, take it, because until they see it, it won't make an indelible impression on their hearts. In fact, he made me give him my text. He said, where's the text? We looked it up in his Bible. He said, yeah, that's going to be a good sermon. I said, well, you pray with me. He said, I'm going to be praying. In fact, bring me a tape. I want to see how it worked. But here's what he told me. Stick with me, folk. Number one, most people think that the only thing that an anchor does is keep you in one place. And that's important. You see, on the water, there is never a time when you can control movement. The waves move beyond your control. The wind blows beyond your control. 
and the current underneath the waves moves beyond your control. There is never a time when the wind is dead still. There is never a time when the waves are flat and the current has stopped. There's always movement. That's why even when it looks calm, you need an anchor. The reason why this church is in so much trouble today is because it looks calm. And there's some folks who say, man, I don't need no anchor. Calm. Ain't no wind. Wave, little bitty thing. I don't see current. So we just let the boat stay right here. And while you're talking, the boat is moving. The Bible says that there are people particularly at the time of the end, who will be blown by every wind of doctrine. Some of you look at strange television programs. I'm not talking about It Is Written and La Voz, the Esperanza and Voice of Prophecy and Breath of Life. I'm talking about, you know, in fact, one man is telling on y'all. Good. He's telling on you. He said, I thank God for the Seventh-day Adventist. He said, I get a lot of money from Seventh-day Adventists. I said, well, he, he, you know, I don't know if he got all the truth, but he, he sure sound good. Wind of doctrine. I'm not telling you everybody out there preaching who is not an Adventist is it, not a Christian. I'm just telling you, you better be careful where you drink. Don't be blown by everything. Got some Seventh-day Adventists now who tell me, we need prayer in school. Well, I don't know about you, but before I went to school, we had prayer. And all day long at school, even at a Christian school, I was praying. Nobody got to stop and tell me when to pray. If you train your children well, nobody got to have a period for them to pray. We need prayer in school. You train your children, there will be prayer in school. You let the right bullies show up, there'll be prayer in school. You let them give a test that you're not prepared for. They'll be prayer in school. Are you listening to me? But we caught up in it and very soon we're going to find ourselves smack dab in the middle of the religious right, apostate Protestantism, and we're going to be riding right along with them because we did not have an anchor. An anchor holds you because you can't control movement. Something is always moving, even when it doesn't look like it's moving. Your family is moving. Your church is shifting. On your job, they're moving. You don't know they're moving if you're moving with them. There's an anchor that they call the deep sea anchor. The deep sea anchor does not hold you in one place. It's like a parachute made out of canvas and you put it under the water, and what happens is that that anchor holds you in a certain direction, but it drifts with the water. Some of us have a little old some kind of anchor, but it's not the right one, and it's not anchored to the rock, because when everything else is moving, all of a sudden somebody says, hey, you moving? No, I'm not. I'm right where I was. So, so number one, the sailor tells me it keeps you in the right place. Number two, and this shocked me, I, I admit to you that I would have embarrassed you because I shouted on the floor of the yacht store. The man said, let me tell you something. The most important thing that an anchor does is it keeps you in the right direction. Wait a minute, wait, ho, oh, oh, whoa, whoa. He said, look here. When the wind starts to blow, if you have a heavy chain, I don't have time to preach all this. You have to preach this to yourself. Drag that anchor along the bottom. It catches the rock. He said, then the wind keeps blowing, and it blows your craft back and stops but since 
it is hooked to the bow of the craft, your craft comes around in a right direction. So now when the wind blows, it blows in your face. You blow behind me, you may mess me up, but as long as I can keep the wind to my face, I can see what's coming. There's a storm out over the ocean, and it's moving this way. But my soul is anchored in Jesus. So I'm facing the storm. When the waves get too high, sometimes the waves get so high that they overcome the ship. And for a few minutes, you can't see where you are. But if I've got an anchor, I don't have to worry about what direction I'm facing because the, the anchor holds me even when I can't see. Are you listening to me? When the current pushes invisibly, the anchor holds me in the right direction. Another problem with our church today is that we, while we are all in one place, we're in all kinds of different directions. So come on, y'all, let's all get together. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm headed in the direction I'm going in. Y'all just go where you're going to go. I'm already going where I'm going. Now stick with me, folk. You may make it when it's calm and you're not in the right direction. But when the wind gets high and when the waves sting and when they toss you up in the air and let you slide down, then if that kind of power hits you from the side, it will tip your craft over, you'll take water and go down. Are you listening to me? The ship was not made to take the wind, the waves, or the current from the side. It takes it from the bow, from the front. So you put your anchor in the front of your life. And let Jesus hold you while the waves roll. And they may come hard, but now if they fool around and hit you this way, you're gone. Are you listening to me? So the anchor holds you in the right direction or in the right attitude. Oh, I think I'm preaching now. We have become a collection of angry people. Mad about little stuff. I don't like these Sabbath school quarters. Well, how you know you haven't studied for 10 years? I don't like the color of the pews and the way it, it relates to the color of the wall. Man, you better be glad they let you in the church. Forget about the colors. If Jesus came in there and wrote your sins on the carpet, but we are, you know, upset. I don't, I don't know. I couldn't park where I wanted to park, and then people telling me where I got to park, and I got to walk all across. Thank God you can walk. If you couldn't walk, you got one of them little things. I wish I could ride in. You know, don't be mad. Just push your little button and roll on up here. Let's stop being an angry church. We ought to spend this energy telling people about Jesus. So, so the anchor holds you in the right direction. Well, let me get through this. If you don't have an anchor, if you don't capsize in the wind or the waves or the current, then as soon as you don't have any direction, you begin to bump into stuff. Well, here come the storm. Oh, I'll tell you, thank you, Jesus, for this illustration. Here come the saints inside the house. I love my job. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody slide over and let them in. Tis the old ship of Zion. There's room for many or more. Come on in the right direction now, aren't you? 
if, if you don't capsize, stick with me, you'll bump into something. There's so much trouble in our churches now because of people bumping into each other. The Dorcas is angry with the pathfinders and the pathfinders hate the elders and the elders are disturbed with the deaconesses and, and the people are mad at the pastor and all these people who are supposed to be working for Jesus because you don't have an anchor, you drift and hit stuff. Run aground and hit rock. Run onto the, onto the dock and tear down some building that's there. Or you run into something else. Seagoing vessels cannot turn quickly. And if you don't have an anchor, you'll drift in the way of one of them. And they'll knock you out, cut you in half, and you'll go down. And the only way to stay clear of everybody else and every other structure is to have an anchor. You've got to have an anchor. Well, let me get to the last one because the storm is coming now. <laughs> Listen to this because I know I'm down your street now. One of the sailors with whom I talked, I was getting ready to go out the door. He said, preacher, come here. <laughs> he said, I got something I didn't tell you. He said, if you don't have an anchor, you can never rest. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, I can explain it to you. He said, one day I got into a craft a little bit bigger than a rowboat. He said, it was such a beautiful day, so calm, that I got in the rowboat, forgot to take an anchor, and rowed out. He said, man, it was so wonderful. Wind was at my back. And now I'm just wrong. He said, before I knew it, I'd gotten way out. I said, hey, I better look back. Turn around and look back. And he was far from the shore. He said, oh, okay, no problem. I'll take a little rest. And while he was taking that rest, he noticed that the wind started blowing him away from the shore. He said, well, okay, no problem. And he rode and beat the wind. In fact, he started closing in on the shore, but his arms began to burn. His muscles got so tired that he could no longer move them. He said, I tell you what I'll do, I'll just rest a minute, put his oars down and sat there, and the wind blew him back past where he had started. He said, uh, no, no problem, no problem. What I'll do is, I'll just, I, I, I'll row again harder. I got it. And it gets up almost there, and his arms froze. Couldn't move him anymore. So he put his oars down just for a minute more, and the wind. pushed him back farther than when he started. He said, Pastor, the only way I got back to shore was to go in the direction of the wind, had to go around the long way and come up on a shore that was miles away from my home. And I learned that without an anchor, you cannot rest. Even a motorboat once it has gotten out into the water, can't turn off the motor if you don't have an anchor. You got to always be. As soon as you stop the engine, then you got to turn it back on. As soon as you turn it off, then one time you try to crank up your engine and it. And you're out of fuel. And all of a sudden you learn that even with a full tank of fuel, you got to have an anchor. What were the five foolish virgins guilty of? They had a full tank of fuel, but evidently no anchor. Are you listening to me? So here's what he says. In order for you to take a break, you got to have an anchor. 
You take a little piece of the trip, you're rowing, drop your anchor. And when you drop your anchor, you can rest. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Listen to me. There's somebody under the sound of my voice today. You've been practicing Christianity for most of your life. But today you are burnt out and tired. You are so on the edge that you can't even relate to your brothers and sisters because you haven't been able to rest. They that wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But you're burnt out because you don't have an anchor. I got one more illustration. And then I've got an appeal. You can't put your anchor just anywhere. The, 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 the oldest of the seamen said to me, he said, Pastor, when you drop your anchor, you can't drop it straight down. He said, you've got to determine before you go out the depths of the water in which you'll be sailing and get an anchor connected to enough line to be five to seven times the depth of the water. Are you listening to me? Five to seven times the depth of the water. So you let the anchor drop, let it catch, and then ease back. Ease back so that the anchor is always in front of you, never below you. Let me tell you what happened. Four men went out to do some deep sea diving. They dropped their anchor straight down. They didn't have enough connector, not enough cable. They jumped in the water and went to enjoy being underneath. While they were gone, a storm came. Because the anchor was straight down, with no give in the cable the water began to pull the boat up but it could not pull the bow so the back of the boat went up and came down up and down it pulled so violently that the connector slid around from the bow to the side of the vessel and then when the wave came and pulled the boat up it did this took on water, broke, and went down. When those four people finally got back up, they found nothing. Two of them were strong enough to make it. Two of them died. We have an anchor. But you can't put Jesus just anywhere in your life. And if you put Jesus just anywhere, you can't be so cavalier that you jump off the boat and go down. I hear people all the time saying, I believe we got enough time so I could go out, enjoy a few things, and make it back in. I wonder what would make you want to leave Jesus? Folk, I haven't done enough things to be an authority but I've talked to folk who've done just about everything and people who had enough money to really sin I'm talking about some serious sin you know what they tell me I wish I had stayed with Jesus Solomon had enough money to try everything got back in time to be saved and to tell you all is vanity ain't nothing you can do outside of Jesus that really brings you joy so if you ever jumped off the ship to go down and have some fun don't do it now and if you've got an anchor don't put it in the wrong place let Jesus lead you don't put him down let him lead you I got one paragraph I need to read because there's something I've got to ask you today. Listen to this. 
if you refuse to come to God and confess your backslidings that he may heal you, there is nothing to be hoped for for you or your poor family in the future. Misery will follow upon the steps of sin. God's hand will be against you and he will leave you to be controlled by Satan, to be led captive by him at his will. You will not know to what lengths you may go. You will be like a man at sea without an anchor. The truth of God is an anchor. You are breaking away from that anchor. Your eternal interests are being sacrificed to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You are on the point of breaking the bounds which would save you from utter destruction. In seeking to save your life by concealing your wrongs, you are losing it. If you now humble yourself before God, confess your wrongs, and return to him with full purpose of heart, yours can yet be a happy family. If you will not do this, but choose your own way, your happiness is at an end. Volume 2, Testimonies, 303. You have an anchor. You have a rock. All you've got to do is to let your anchor take hold of the rock. Will your anchor hold in the time of storm? If Jesus is your rock, yes it will. I don't care what is before us. Some people sitting around trying to worry about the time of trouble. Forget about the time of trouble and get your anchor in Jesus. Trouble may come and trouble may go. But if you're anchored in the rock, you'll never be blown away. Tracy, where are you, sweetheart? You need to listen to the words of this song. Because after this song, I'm going to make an appeal at camp meeting and it may surprise you.
speaks peace unto my storm clouds. This name speaks calm unto my fears. And when I feel that no one loves me, his loving presence is so near that name is Jesus. Oh, how I love him, the one who gave his life for me. Because Eternally. Amen. Thank you, Stacy. There's a storm out over the ocean, and it's moving this way. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, you'll surely drift away. Folk, I'm going to do something today that might seem strange, but I'm learning now that Jesus specializes in strange things. There is somebody at camp meeting today who has never been baptized. Today, you need an anchor. You need a rock. And you have them both if you'll simply give your life to Jesus. I'm going to call you my brother. I'm going to call you, my sister, to get up at camp meeting and come and stand beside me and say, I want to be baptized. Is there anybody like that today? If you're standing on the edge, if you're sitting in the middle, no matter what your situation may be, I call you in the name of Jesus to be baptized. Would you come now? Would you get up from your seat? Would you move from your place? You need to be baptized. This storm is coming whether you like it or not. And you need to be ready. I call you in Jesus' name. Would you move right now? Would you move right now? You need to be baptized. You need to be baptized. I call you in Jesus' name. Where are you? Stand up and let the Holy Spirit move you. Come to Jesus. You need to be baptized. There's a storm that's coming. And it's moving fast now. And if your soul is not anchored in the rock Christ Jesus, you're going to be swept away. But today Jesus offers you himself as a rock. And the anchor which is the hope in his salvation. I call you now. Would you get up out of your chair? Would you come out of your place? Walk towards me, but come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Where are you? The Lord told me you were here. You don't have to respond, but you know you're here. Stand up where you are. Move from where you are. Come to Jesus right now. In the name of Jesus, I call you. Father in heaven, I can't say the right thing, but you can. Fill this place up with holy angels. Let angels stand beside that very one who needs to move and let them usher that person down here. Let them bring the one who needs to come. But bring that person before it's eternally too late because there's a storm coming, Lord, and you told me to say what I said today, and having said it, I must call. Now, Lord, you make it happen. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Where are you? Where are you? you need to be baptized.
somebody else. There's somebody else. There's somebody else. Been hanging around the church, but you've never been baptized into it. You got to have an anchor, my brother. You got to have a rock, my sister. I call you in Jesus' name. I call you in Jesus' name. Come to him today. Get your anchor sure and steadfast. I call you in Jesus' name. Where are you? This is not about numbers. It's about who Jesus calls. And there's somebody who Jesus calls. I call you in the name of Jesus. Now let me add to that. And you got to listen carefully now. Because I'm not trying to get everybody at camp meeting up on their feet. There's somebody who has drifted away. But you're here today. And before you leave today, you want to get your anchor into the rock. This may be a harder call than the first one I made. But there's somebody who needs to answer it. You've been drifting. Maybe nobody knew you were drifting. Maybe everybody knew you were drifting. But today, the Lord calls you to come back home to put your anchor in the rock. I call you in the name of Jesus. Come and stand with us. Come back home and get your anchor in the rock. Where are you? You're not in a strange place today. You are surrounded by people who love you, people who are praying for you. But there's an invisible cloud of witnesses. There are holy angels who are above this place. The Holy Spirit is above this canopy. The Lord watches in this place today. And there's somebody who needs to come home today. I call you today in the name of Jesus. Would you come? Would you come now? Would you get up out of your seat and move this way? Come boldly now. Don't leave here without an anchor. Don't leave here without your anchor in the rock, Christ Jesus. You came to camp meeting. You don't know why. But now you understand. I call you in the name of Jesus. Don't leave this place without getting your anchor in the rock. Well, why do I have to come down to the front? There are a lot of answers. But one of them is you need to give somebody else strength. And when the Lord lets them see you being moved by his spirit, somebody else will see a sermon in your life. There's somebody else who needs to move. I call you now in the name of Jesus. Come to him right now. Come to him right now. You drifted away, but nobody knows. Maybe back at your church, they've got you in some office. But I'll tell you today that the nominating committee can't get you into heaven. It takes the anchor. It takes the rock. I call you in the name of Jesus. Come home today. You're at camp meeting, but you need to come home. I call you in the name of Jesus. Got to close this one pretty soon. Got to close it pretty soon. Have people tell me all the time, if you just stayed open a little longer, Pastor. Well, your little longer has come and gone. It's time for you to move. There's somebody who came here today, you didn't plan to do what I'm asking you to do in Jesus' name. But the reason why the Lord brought you was for this. I call you in the name of Jesus. Bring your life to him. Give yourself back to him. Get your anchor in the rock. Would you move now? Need you to move now? Need you to move now? Maybe everybody at home thinks you're already anchored. But that's what they think. You and Jesus know something else. I call you in the name of Jesus. I call you in the name of Jesus. Somebody's holding back. The Lord just told me about you. There's somebody here today who won't move. God bless you, my sister. You're fighting. You're fighting. Why in the world would you fight Jesus? He says, I'll, I'll be your rock and I'll be your anchor if you'll just let me have your life. There's somebody who should have moved a long time ago. Certainly you ought to move now. Where are you? Where are you? I call you for the last time in this meeting. You may have a thousand more opportunities to come to Jesus. But there's somebody in here who will never hear another call. As big as this congregation is, there's somebody in this room who will never hear another call. I sure wish you'd come to this one. There's somebody in here who will never hear another appeal. There's somebody in here who will never feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart again. 
I call you in the name of Jesus. I call you in Jesus' name. You need to move. You need to move. I'm not going to water it down, folks. It's, I'm not taking it down to some little thing where everybody stands up. It's not going there today. The Lord has not impressed me to go there. I'm calling for people who need to come home to Jesus, who need to, need to make their peace calling and election sure. I call you in the name of Jesus. And I got one more, and, and that's all. Listen, listen carefully. There's somebody here today who is so tired because you haven't been able to rest. Now you need to listen to me. The tiredness does not come by doing evil. The tiredness sometimes comes from doing good. But if you're not anchored in Jesus, you can't rest. There's somebody here today who loves Jesus with all of their heart, but they're so tired they're about to give up so burnt out that they're about to throw in the towel i want to ask you to stand up where you are because we're going to ask the lord today to renew your strength to give you your anchor so you can rest just stand up before we pray there's somebody else out there who ought to move I, if i knew who you were i'd come get you is there anybody out there who knows you need to move but you can't come by yourself hold your hand up one of these pastors We'll come and get you. I'll come get you. Is there someone else who needs to come but you can't make it? Hold your hand up. We'll come and help you. There's somebody else who needs to come. God bless you. Oh, people are coming from everywhere. I wish you would say amen for the power of God. I don't know about you, but I think this is what camp meeting is all about. What do you say? If you go home and nothing happened, then what did you do? What was it about? Is there somebody else who needs to get under the wire? Under the wire. I call you in Jesus' name. There's somebody who's tired who needs to stand up. You're not tired from doing all the evil things. You, you're tired because you haven't had an anchor. Jesus is your anchor. And you need to renew your strength. But there's one somebody who may need to come down. I need to ask you, would you move now? Would you move now? We're about to pray. Mr. President, this is your flock. This is your church. Please, please offer this prayer. Almighty God, you have revealed to us today the visitation of your Holy Ghost in this place. This is not man's doing. You've been with us all day long and you have nurtured us spiritually that we have come to this part of the service where the souls of men and women hang in a balance between life and death salvation and damnation the preacher has made it clear the Gospel Commission has gone out to every soul and the invitation has been made. Oh Lord, we thank you for those who pull themselves away from the grip of Satan. They wanted to hold them back and said to Satan, get behind me and Jesus, here I come. Thank you. Dear Jesus, thank you in the name of the Lord. But Lord, your servant, many of us here, we know that there are many more that are still in the valley of decision. Lord, speak to the heart. Chase the fear away. Chase chase the scandalizing concept that we have that if we show ourselves that we must come to Jesus then we're saying to somebody else and we're weak or we're not worthy who is worthy there are many who are standing who are making commitments saying Jesus I want to be more than I am 
Once again, Pastor Pearson never disappoints. <laughs> Another great message from him. I'm so glad that he was part of our Camp Meeting Throwback series. Amen. Amen. Powerful work. Yes, yes. And of course, we want to give you those same reminders that we have been that 